Hello. So I think we have our participants. So I will start by welcoming, welcoming everyone to the Food for Sustainability and Grow webinar. Today we are going to run the second session on precision agriculture. And we're going to explore satellite robo robotics, DNA sequencing, which are some of the cutting edge technologies that enable a precision agriculture. So please stay, stay with us while we'll explore its significance, the challenge and what is innovative about these technologies. And as we seen last Thursday, precision agriculture revolutionized traditional farming practices by integrated advanced technologies to optimize crop production. And we have covered from satellite imagery and drones to data analytics and automation. Precision agriculture indeed empowers farmers to make more informed decisions, particularly tailored to their individual fields, ultimately to enhance efficiency, sustainability, and of course, yield. However, you know, not, not everything is rosy and adopting a, a precision agriculture poses several challenges for farmers. And these include managing complex data, the initial investment calls, costs, and of course, ensuring accessibility and usability ac across all farming scales. So it's by addressing these ch uh, challenges that we can actually maximize the potential of precision agriculture and foster its widespread adoption. And I count with your views to enrich our discussion and to let us know more what you think about this issue. Today, we are honored to have experts uh, who will be sharing uh, their insights. Uh, we have with us Paula Mendes from Technical. She's a renowned researcher in geo resources with a great focus on water. And Paula will be bringing her expertise in leveraging technology for sustainable agriculture. Thank you so much, Paula, for your presence here. Then we'll have Pedro Laranjeira from Expertural Tech. And Pedro has a strong background in IoT solutions. And Pedro will shed light on the role of connectivity and sensor technology in precision agriculture. And also our dear Francisca from Food for Sustainability. She's a microbiologist and Francisca's expertise in microbiology will enrich our discussion. Francisca will be highlighting how soil health and microbiota can be um, placed under the umbrella of precision agriculture. So we all extend our gratitude to all the speakers for sharing their valuable knowledge and their insights here with us today. But I also would like to thank the audience for your active participation and engagement in this important conversation. Just before we proceed, let me remind you that um, the sessions are recorded. So uh, if you just click to the to the policy, you you agree uh, to being recorded. So thank you uh, for that. And to remind you that you can pose your questions to the speaker after each speaker presentation. And probably by now you know where. Yes, it's Slido. So we'll be using Slido for, for your questions. I promise I keep a very attentive eye on Slido. And we'll also use Slido just as a warm up to the topic to see, you know, how is your knowledge on precision uh, farming? So probably by now you also know how to get into Slido. Rita is already uh, giving us a hand here. So if you just type um, www.slido.com, you can do this in your PC or in your mobile. Once you get in, you have a box with an hashtag. Just insert the code F4S Academy. So F4S Academy and you should be in and able to join us in the polls tab. <clears throat> so you will see two polls, uh, two tabs, sorry, one for your um, Q&A, so uh, your questions, and the other one for the little poll, uh, the small poll that uh, we have prepared for you. So are we all ready, Krita? Can we jump? Can we see the questions? Okay, so the first one uh, relates to 
uh, adoption rates of precision farming. So if we consider the most digitalized European uh, countries, do you have an idea what is the average adoption rate uh, in these countries? And while you vote, uh, it's true that artificial intelligence and machine learning, they keep improving and they keep to revolutionize the mainstream applications um, and they keep bringing new applications to, to the market. But particularly countries like the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark and France are at the forefront of precision farming. So you have an idea. Uh, what sort of adoption rates these countries have. Okay, and we are talking about the most digitalized countries. So I think we have a... Let's see if everyone has voted. Yes, I think we have a, a winner. And <clears throat> Pedro, you will shed more light on this because you work with farmers in, on every day, but the figures I have here, they are slightly higher. So uh, between 30 and 50 percent of farmers in countries like the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark and France, they use some sort of precision farming tools. Still, there's quite a lot of scope to, to, to improve um, the, 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 the adoption and the spread of precision farming. So thank you so much for taking part. Great. Let's see the second question. And the second question, this will be a topic that uh, Parliament is going to be ad uh, addressing. And it talks about surrogate variables and uh, what are the challenge of using surrogate variables in machine learning algorithms to map agro-environmental variables. So I will give you a hand here just to put it very <clears throat> plainly. A surrogate variable is one that can be measured or at least easily measured in place of another variable that cannot be measured or is very difficult to measure. And in social sciences, we use this quite often. So concepts like happiness is difficult um, to measure. So we use uh, surrogate variables or proxy uh, variables. But these variables are very, very important because they allow us and we have a tie. So I need to ask at least one more vote. And thank you so much. <laughs> But these variables are very important because um, machine learning algorithms, they establish relationships between inputs and outputs. So they are uh, helping us to understand unforeseen scenarios and to identify distributions uh, that are based uh, on observations that are different from the ones that where the models were built. So what is the challenge of using this surrogated uh, variables and we have a tie again so <laughs> I was going to need <laughs> someone else to 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 vote uh, Gonzalo did you want to jump on Slido and uh, tell us what oh you have done it okay but it's true that I think Poland you you'll get you'll shed some more light on this but I think everything is kind of interrelated but I would say that the start starting point is the limited availability or quality of the surrogated data. So this is what's not enabling, you know, more uh, uh, accuracy of the models and uh, it needs um, still some improvement from that end. So great, thank you so much for, for taking part. And let's go to, to our next and final questions. So this is the topic and the expertise of Francisca, and it's something that is very dear also to Food for Sustainability, microorganisms. Okay, do you have an idea uh, how many individual microorganisms are in a teaspoon of topsoil? And this, of course, needs to be high quality topsoil, right, Francisca? These need to be living soil. So we are talking about um, 1 million, 1 billion, 10 million microorganisms. Any of these numbers, we can tell that they are uh, quite big. And as you all know, soil organisms are responsible for many critical ecosystem process on which the humans depend and we are talking about uh, supporting plant growth or storing carbon 
or just simply being a vast reservoir of pharmaceuticals like antibiotics. So they are really, really critical. So uh, a teaspoon of topsoil. So we have, uh, I, I don't think I will allow the 10th person to vote because we have here a winner. And it's true, a teaspoon contains over 1 billion individual microorganisms and around 10,000 different species. So this really points to the importance of soil as a living organism because it contains, you know, uh, at least um, more, you know, people that, that, that uh, there are people on Earth. So more living organisms than people on Earth in a teaspoon. It's absolutely amazing. Okay. Thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed uh, taking part in this slide. So I'll now invite um, Paula Mendes to jump to, uh, to the stage. Let me just briefly introduce you to Paula. So Paula Mendes holds, holds a PhD and a master's degree in georesources from EST, which is the Technical Institute here in Lisbon. And she's a, also a water resource engineering with a bachelor's from University of Évora. Uh, Paula Mendes has contributed to the drafting of the legal diploma for the delimitation of strategic areas for the protection and recharge of aquifers for the National Ecological Reserve. She's also the author of 28 articles with a total of 635 citations. And she was also the president of the Specialized Commission on Groundwater of the Portuguese Association of Water Resources. Paula, thank you so much for your availability and the floor. Thank is you new. for having me. I, I'm trying again to share. OK, now I understand what is passing. OK, so it's not difficult. Let me see. OK. Uh, it moves. <laughs> OK, don't worry. We no, still... it's my it's it's something that I have here. OK, now it's done. OK, now I think that no. When I try to put it on share. Ah, it's, like, it's perfect. It's... Yeah, we can see can it. Can you see it? Yes, okay, and it's so on presentation well. mode. Oh, well, OK, thank you. OK, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to present, uh, well, let us see. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give a brief introduction about machine learning algorithms and surrogate variables. Then I'm going to present two examples about how to use these machine learning algorithms and surrogate variables for two uh, case studies. One related to uh, try to assess uh, the topsoil moisture content in the uh, in a vineyard and another related with mapping nitrates in groundwater and then as I, I finish with the final remarks so as you know uh, 20 years ago what we had was knowledge driven models so what was expect it was that we have some kind of subjective rating methods to assess uh, the variables and they were this was done based on delphi panels which means that the, it was the experts that define which variables were more important to define some issue for instance to define the vulnerability of groundwater to uh, contamination by agricultural activities. That was done based on expressed sensibility, which defined ranked which variables could be more important to try to assess which areas or which aquifers are more vulnerable to groundwater, to contamination by agricultural activities. Now, in our days, what we are using uh, for a lot of different uh, issues is data-driven models. These, of course, can be statistical motivated methods, such as logistic regression, and uh, a set of methods known as artificial intelligence or machine learning. 
So how I can explain very in a simplified way what is a, how it works a machine learning algorithm. We have a pool of data. Then we use a machine learning algorithm where we divide our data in the training data. This normally is two thirds of the data and one third would be the validation data. Then we know that the model is trained, is working, when we know when the arrow that we obtain from validation data is very small. Okay. And we can have there are a lot of different, we can have also have clusters and so on, but let us look just for this kind of machine learning algorithms, the ones related with predictive model, like a regression model. So we are defined, for instance. What is the content of the soil related with uh, some uh, uh, macronutrient, for instance, or the classification model where we want to assess, for instance, in the area, which of these areas have some, I don't know, some disease in the, in the crop. So we can use the, the machine learning algorithms for predict and for classify. So what about some weighted variables? They are very used in the machine learning algorithms because it's impossible for us to measure in the field. It's very expensive sometimes, and other times we cannot have access to the variables. So we use variables that we know that are correlated to the variable that we wish to assess. That is what, what is surrogate variables. Then to use they are using situations where the origin of variable is difficult to assess, expensive to measure, or subject to measurement error. This is in a small scale, for instance, if you are going to measure something that is going to change if you measure, then you have to use somehow a surrogate variable, okay? Random forest is a machine learning algorithm that can be used in the regression mode to predict, let us put it like this, not in the regression, but to predict a value or to classify. In my case, I'm, I'm going to show you how to use to classify some variables. So what we have, we have our training data and the and the, what this algorithm do and is named ensemble algorithm because because it's uh, like you have a lot of decision trees, is construct uh, a lot of trees that can be calibrated. We choose the number of, of trees that we want to have in the forest, and this is related to metrics. And then based on that, each tree is going to try to classify based on some feature, the data, okay? And we have some um, criteria to define the branch of the tree, okay? In this case, in classification modes, you, we use Gini index for doing that. So let me start with the first example. The first example was in a vineyard, as I was, as you saw, and is located in the Compañía das Lesirias. It's the vineyard of Carapateira, I believe that is the name. And what was done in the field in the three dates was to measure the top soil moisture of the soil using the probe that was calibrated in the laboratory of geotechnics here at uh, uh, um, Technic. What you have there are the measurements, the, the points where were measured the, 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 the soil moisture, and they were also geo reference. Uh, so you have the coordinates of the location of the points that were measured in the soil. Why this? Because as you can see there, we don't have enough uh, points measure to calibrate a machine learning algorithm. But we'll use geostatistic first to have more points, and then we use a machine learning algorithm. So. Looking at here, you can see uh, the photographs of the vineyards during that uh, three uh, periods of time. You have in December 2017, January 2018, and May 2018. And you can see below 
uh, standardized precipitation evaporation index to the scale of six months. Why six months? Because it's the one that is related with agriculture drought. What we were assessing was for the, our uh, monitoring time, which kind of uh, um, year uh, were we having? Which kind of months? Are we in the wet months? Were we in the drought period? So what we saw, it was that December 2017 was classified as a normal month, but 2017 was a drought year. January 2018 it had average conditions, and May 2018 was is classified as extremely wet. So what was done basically was to use uh, some remote uh, sensing imager, imagery, imaging. So we have here the Sentinel-1 emission, where it was used uh, image from the radar, and then also the, uh, uh, we use image from the multispectral instrument, like uh, near infrared and red. And then you also use, and these were uh, the features that one want, we want you to see if they work to uh, pre to classify the top soil of the vineyard area, area if it is above or below a soil moisture content threshold, okay? And then we have the target variable. In this case, we use the measurements that we uh, measure in the field, okay, with using uh, the probe. And then we use an indicator crinkle to extend our data because we can, in machine learning, we have to have a lot of data to feed the algorithm. And then we use also digital, digital, uh, digital elevation model that was assessed uh, going to the field and using GPS, okay? And then by that, we try, we use uh, I think we lost. Paula, let's see if um, the interconnection. No, I think she. I think Paula managed to drop. Let's just give Paula a couple of minutes to see if she's coming back. Not to cut the the, the reasoning, uh, Pedro. This is something that you're familiar with, right? Uh, yes, trying to it's, use... uh, yeah. the professor is doing uh, uh, good support for me in terms of my presentation because it's explaining exactly also the way that we constructed our uh, models for prediction and classification using our technology. So we will address uh, this. Uh, so it's it's been a very nice uh, presentation because it's giving a uh, already a lot of information uh, how to do it in terms of the different um, uh, machine learning algorithms modeling and so on yes yes but but the goal Pedro, is 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 then to to get rid rid of the all the sensors in the field and the, just use satellite uh, technique or do you think we will always to use uh, need to use probes and measurements at the field level I think everything is is valid because it's complementary. It's a, it will be also part of my my presentation to to show how complementary can be different types of technologies that is being used at the moment from okay. ground so, sensors to satellites, etc. Fantastic, great introduction. Um, so, Paulo, you're back. Great. Yeah. Uh, you <clears throat> know what happened because. I'm uh, technically shouldn't be the my internet should be good. <laughs> so. No worries, no worries. Okay, so we were following very closely your your presentation. You were just saying uh, how you were calibrating your model with the sensors in the fields yeah. and the satellites. Uh, okay. And I think we are ready to. Can you see the screen? No, okay. not sharing. I should be. And now? No. 
it takes a little time, okay? We have right, some okay. kind of delay. So let me try again. No? Can you see it? Not from my end, not yet, but we know it works. Mm. Yes, it's okay, coming. It's coming. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, so sorry for this. Uh, it's not usual, but sometimes it happens. I don't know why, because I'm not using wireless. I'm using, uh, well, let us uh, start. Uh, so related with the kind of criterion that it was used, as you, as I was saying, December 2017 was a drought year. If you look at the box plots that you have there on your right, you will see that the average and the median are very close to 14%. So this was the threshold that was used to classify the areas of the top soil that were uh, the topsoil moisture content. So we classify the areas in are the areas uh, above 14% in terms of moisture or are below. And the reason to use the top to define as topsoil is because radar just can um, capture the moisture of the soil at five centimeters. Okay. So when we went to the to the field, when we used the Tether probe, what we did is to just to measure the five centimeters uh, moisture content of the soil. Okay, so we use like target variable, uh, classified variable that was used based on fourteen percent above or below, and then we use two kinds of uh, uh, image one related with radar and what other related with multi-spectral instrument related with near infrared and red and then we use it in random forest and we obtain a classification that can I show you here where we have for instance uh for the vineyard the areas that are above and below the soil moisture content of 14 percent for the december 2017 january 2018 and may 2018 okay i have to say because we use radar image that the first ones because the vineyards don't have the leaves work well but the third one may 2018 the year was um was larger. So we we I I show you the three dates here, but I have to say in terms of what we can uh, uh, expect is more probable to have something like that in December 2017, in January 2018 in the field, because these two uh, images are more these two maps are better calibrated. Okay. Then we have another example. This one is related with the, uh, as you know, uh, we have nitrate vulnerable zones. So we have to, when you have a farm that is located in nitrate vulnerable zone, we have to respect some uh, um, codes, okay, related to the way to to do your uh, uh, to address some issues or the the way. And so uh, I'm going to, have to speak a little more uh, rapidly, so I don't have time. So here, what we have in the left slide is the maps that in 2000 were used. What we done by then was to use geostatistic. So we went to the field, we measured the nitrates contents in groundwater, and then using geostatistics, we were doing the maps. There, what you have is uh, in the uh, uh, Tagus alluvian aquifer. Uh, this is a, uh, normally the crops that we have here is maize. And what you can see here is that during that three periods of time, there was an increase in probability of occurrence of nitrates in groundwater above 50 milligrams per liter. Nowadays, and this is a very interesting case. This is in Spain. We are using uh, machine learning algorithms. So what we 
Dent here is using period one, 2009. We use uh, measurements in the field and a lot of uh, features. And then we calibrate the, the model and you validate for the period two, 2010. And then we predict if the nitrates are, are going to be in 2017 above or below the 50 milligrams per liter in groundwater. This was done for Andalusia. So we pass from a small piece in the aquifer system to a whole region with the mission of Portugal. So it's 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 amazing what these kind of uh, methodologies can do. And now we'll talk a little about surrogate because as expecting, because we are looking at the scale of a region, we are using uh, surrogate variables. For instance, for phonology, it was used modish terra surface reflectance at a resolution 2050 meters. And then what we used was NDVI in a lot of metrics. This metrics allows us to understand or the, 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 the algorithm to, to try to assess what was the status of the crops during the period that we were evaluating the nitrates in uh, groundwater. Then we have livestock census for Andalusia region where we take, we have to have some kind of density measures and we also have to take in consideration if we were talking about poultry, dairy, etc. And then we have a digital terrain model from LIDAR. I have to say that Spain is more advanced than us. They have a lot of, uh, now they have LIDAR, we just have LIDAR data for the coastal areas in Portugal and then and the Lucy Environment Information Network for the weather and so on at the time, where we decide, for instance, we uh, try to assess what was the precipitation in the last three months before we were measuring the nitrates contents in groundwater, and then soil te texture and so on. So the results that we have there, you can see on your left side the probability of having. 50 milligrams per liter of nitrates in groundwater in Andalusia region. And then the difference between the probability occurrence in 2010 and 2017. So just as final remarks, with the increase in the use of sensors in the Internet of Things and the availability of satellite imagery with higher spatial and temporal resolutions, the potential for accurate prediction and classification is expanding rapidly as the volume and quality of the data continue to improve. It becomes increasingly feasible to map agro environmental features such as top uh, soil moisture and the probability of concentration of nitrates above 50 milligrams per liter in groundwater. This is the reference. Please, uh, if you want, you can go there. And you have also my email if you have some question that you want to, or something that you want to work and talk with me about. And again, it was a pleasure. It was very nice to be here. Thank you. Paula, thank you so much for such an interesting insights on how machine learning algorithms can be applied to topsoil moisture and nitri nitrates on, on groundwater. Really, really interesting. So basically what you have shown here, it's how these models are constructed. So you, you, you actually um, um, exemplify the path to ensure that we have all the data needed um, so that the models are predictive. So how can this be taken Forward. So now we have the model running. Um, can we? Do we need to keep feeding the models with data, or do you think there is a time when okay, we have the model is perfect. They have learned now they can. So what are your insights basing on the probabilities and the actual measures? I think that there is always room for improvement. So it's true, yes, that. Uh, 
uh, when the idea to have a machine learning algorithm is that when, when it's trained, you can use it to predict or to classify something based on features that you have. But then again, it's important to have additional data that you can, for instance, I think that my colleague Pedro Lanager is going talking about that. If you have data that is uh, measuring in real time, you can fed the algorithm and you have classification in the forecast in real time. And that is the, the thing that is amazing to have now this kind of uh, technology. Okay, and that, that takes me to 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 a question. So, because throughout your presentation, I think it's you pointed very clear what are the benefits of such predictive models. But you also highlighted that uh, um, accuracy and availability of the data are critical for these models to to produce uh, outcomes correctly. So my question is. Uh, in terms of fostering adoptions, you know, some some research points that, you know, the the, the data, uh, farmers don't feel very confident about the data that these models are predicted. So my question to you as probably as a researcher, your answer might be obvious, but do you think that we should do more in research and perfect these models before taking them uh, to a commercial stage, or do you think it's important that we also have these modules uh, commercially available so we can keep testing them and predicting? So, is there a trade off, or are we rushing things and then, you know, putting more skeptical people about precision farming? Okay, in case of if, if you want to talk about the precision farming, I have to say that normally the problems related in machine learning algorithms has to do with overfitting of the data, okay? So we have data that are very specific of a site and that mm -hmm. can be issue. Normally it can be issue because we want to generalize the, the issue. So instance, if you are training a model, you want that is going to predict even the, if the features, the variables that fit the model change, okay? But are the same, but change over time, okay? In the case of uh, when we talk about the precision agriculture, I have to say the idea to have a lot of data uh, and use machine learning is must be commercial because I think that in our days, if you think about the, the amount of sensors that you can have in the field. And if you think that even you can try to do it in real time, and by doing that, you will have a lot of, I think that, yes, it cannot work, but if, it's do it, if you do that well, taking consideration the overfitting, taking consideration the quality of the measures, measurements that you are having in the field, if the, your probes are well calibrated, if you know exactly what what you measure, sometimes people don't know. <laughs> that's a, that's a lot of, all, of variables there also. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> if you take in consideration all of that, yes, I think that is going to be something that is better to have it than not have it. To be commercial, what it, what it does, it impl implies that people are going to look and and the part of research is going to be exponential, mm -hmm. okay? If money works, if you have money, <laughs> research is going to increase and you have better algorithms and you have better solutions. Yes, indeed. I would uh, definitely invite our audience also to, to take part in this discussion because I know uh, some of you uh, already use precision agriculture, and it would be very interesting if you could join this this uh, discussion, particularly from a practitioner's point of view. Uh, Paula, thank you so much. We'll move on um, to to Pedro. Pa What's Pedro, a you have a, 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 the other side, the, the other perspective. It will be very nice to hear. So. Pedro is graduated in uh, chemical engineering by the Institute of Engineering 
in Lisbon, and he also has a post-graduation in advanced management by Catholic Lisbon School, School Business and Economics. Currently, he's working at Expetrol Tech as a vice president for global sales. Um, Pedro' uh, experience is relevant on management, sales, and product specialists, and he has a variety of analytical and science techniques such as such as XRD, XFR, ICP, HPLC, G GC, Raman, IR. You will tell us all about this, and lately on multispectral imaging imaging uh, combining uh, combined with artificial intelligence with the XLORA solution from X Spectral Tech applied to agriculture. Right, Pedro, thank you so much for being here. The floor thank is you now much. yours. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Let me start sharing. Okay. It's everyone. Seeing the presentation. Yes, Pedro, all is well from this end. OK, so thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity to have this uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, I will give a, a little introduction about uh, uh, Spectral Tech. So Spectral Tech is a Portuguese company based in Braga. And since uh, some years that we are dedicated to using multispectral um, analysis together with machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. And we are using this in different type of applications from medicine, cultural heritage, and also for uh, agriculture. So for agriculture, we have XLORA, which is the, the, the brand that has all the, the work done uh, regarding uh, uh, precision agriculture, machine learning, and all that we will see now regarding prediction and detection of um, of diseases. So starting with the presentation, why we moved for um, this field of uh, agriculture? First of all, in the company, we, we, we have a, a group of agronomists, uh, IT people, so data scientists and so on. So a group of people that uh, combining uh, expertise in these fields. And we look to the to the market of agriculture and we see that there is a lot of uh, issues that already are going on uh, worldwide. And in the future, will we even be uh, uh, worst uh, scenarios like the, the production loss because of diseases and plagues, um, the climate changes that it's uh, almost every day in the TV news at, at the moment, and then the big demand that there is to feed all this global uh, pop, uh, population that we have in the, in the world. So we try um, with uh, XLORA to find some solutions. So we, we started to look to some key points like uh, uh, crop risk, risk management with all these climate changes, low this instability in production, uh, context and, and control. Um, then also in terms of the precision agriculture in crops, there is a lot uh, going on now in the in the in the market, but there is also not it's not very clear to everyone what is precision agriculture and what can be the benefits. There is a lot of different types of uh, proposals in the market, which is also confusing uh, the people. And uh, almost everyone is presenting that they have the one solution uh, for all the problems that are addressed. And this is being also an issue that we are seeing uh, in terms of the perception of, of the market. Then on the other side, we have this, all this technology uh, going on and we are meeting uh, farmers that they don't are so knowledgeable. So there is a lot of, uh, let's say, reluctance in changing the, the practice that some of the people are doing for years, years and years, decades uh, in some, some cases. Um, they don't are very mean with, with technology and also 
we see that there is a need to fast uh, uh, catch up. So, what we do uh, in Xlore is start to address some of these, let's say, problems or issues that are in the market. So we we are trying to to give a dynamic uh, solution for the farmer to manage the everyday uh, work in the in the farm. We want to be uh, a solution that can be fast, precise, and non-destructive, like we will see. We want to be also as user friendly as possible to to everyone, to every farmer, to to use our solution. And uh, in the meantime, we want also to support the cost reduction and to have also a more take uh, uh, informed decision from the farmers' uh, side. So this is we try to to be, let's say, uh, common grounds that uh, the farmers can meet uh, um, all the, the expectations to have a healthier and a better crop. And how we do it. So we do it in the way that we have precision agriculture. We have also the production losses that we are seeing more and more in the different countries. We have also organic farming uh, growing more and more, so trying to avoid some of the traditional pesticides and so on. So there is a lot of challenges. So we develop the, the excellent solution that we will uh, see in, uh, in the next slides to be a way to grab all the information, put the results to give to the to the farmer to help them to increase the productivity and also at the same time to have the sustainable uh, agriculture. So we're trying to be a solution that can be part of the daily work of uh, every farmer um, on their own farm. And how do we do it? So we have three uh, let's say components, three parts uh, of our uh, solution. We developed um, a very practical and handheld multispectral uh, device that we called Baku, and I will explain later why we gave the name uh, Baku. Uh, Baku is bringing leaf reading, uh, non-destructive leaf reading to the, to the field. ID of diseases, ID of nutritional deficiencies, uh, and many other things like water stress analysis and so on. So this is uh, uh, um, what we use to measure uh, samples in the field uh, to support um, our classification, like the professor was saying uh, before. Then we have also another a tool that is the sensit light. It is a sensor station where we grab weather information, soil information. We try to be autonomous, so with solar panels and so on. And with all these sensors uh, in the field, we support the predictive part of um, of the analysis. So with the Baku, we have the classification. With the sensit, we have the prediction. All these data goes to our um, cloud solution, the Xlora uh, solution, where we have the data analysis, where then we have also uh, alerts uh, by SMS, emailing, periodic reports, and so on. But the cloud uh, solution, uh, the Xlora solution, it's where we combine all these data with our machine learning uh, algorithms to have the prediction and to have the classification. For the for the sensit lights so or for the sensor parts, we have a wide range of different uh, uh, sensors uh, in terms of the, the the weather and also about the soil, and all this information it's in real time. So this means that even in a mobile phone with our application, a farmer can know immediately what are the weather predictions, but also to have some insights about the possibilities of uh, some diseases uh, to happen in the uh, coming days. So with this, we use um, these uh, sensit light um, uh, devices and uh, sensors. 
in the field, uh, we have the portable multispectral leaf analyzer. So it's, it's, it's a very small instrument, two kilos, okay, that goes to the field. And by uh, placing a leaf inside, okay, we don't even need to, to cut the leaf. So the instrument can go to the to the leaf, it opens the door, the leaf goes inside, it closes the doors without cutting the leaf. And uh, so we do non-destructive in case uh, the, the farmer doesn't want to, to destroy a leaf and keep the same leaf for continuous uh, measurement. And we do this uh, using um, uh, wavelengths from the visible and infrared uh, range. And um, it collects uh, several images uh, in different um, uh, wavelengths and all these multispectral images and all these multispectral images are going to our cloud and are processed and uh, will give us uh, in the end uh, multispectral uh, image combined uh, from from these uh, uh, images collected so we have here uh, an example of a leaf when we look to with our eye so we are normal our eyes are in the visible range we look to a leaf and it looks like beautiful so green colorful and so on after the analysis in the different wavelengths and processing this is the actual uh state of the, the the leaf so there is already problems that only looking to the to the leaves with our own eyes we were not able to uh to identify um also the professor like explained it uh, already very well how this works and it's the way that we are working we are collecting thousands and thousands of leaves and doing the measurements of these leaves every year okay so it's the only way uh, we are continuously so every year it starts uh, a new year for us of data collection let's because we need to feed the algorithm as much as possible to have uh, improvements uh, and also to grow the algorithm for instance if we want to go to certain diseases that we are not yet um Having our algorithm, we need to uh, to analyze uh, more and more. So, by by, for instance, last year for for uh, for viticulture, so for vineyards, we had, for instance, three agronomists uh, from end of April till late July every day. Three agronomists in the field with three instruments, doing a lot of uh, thousands of measurements. Uh, to give us more and more data, to be more and more robust in terms of the information that we are giving to the to the farmer. So the combination in the Explorer Cloud, it's where the the, the machine learning it's 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 happening. But before going there, I want to give this this um, this image because um, we are not competing with other technologies like from information from satellites, information coming from drones and so on. So we are, like you saw, we have solutions to be in the field. So um, this is a, an example of, of, of a map that we can see uh, from, from the top. We can know where are more or less the problems, but we don't know exactly what is the problem, okay? It can be, a problem of, of a disease, water stress, whatever. So with drones and also with with, uh, with uh, satellites, it's very difficult to identify precisely the, the, the um, what is the problem. Our solution, it's really complementary to that because we can know, and mainly with the tobacco, and the tobacco it's because uh, it was designed for, uh, in the beginning to analyze uh, um, leaves in the vineyards. So it's why we call it Baku. So we can go to each leaf, to each plant, and to know exactly what is the problem there. So this is only to, to, to give uh, some, some information. When we are inside our, our uh, uh, solution, we have here uh, on this side, on time, the, the information about the, the, the sensors from the weather station. And here, 
we have a vineyard, so this uh, green symbol it's, it's because we have the, 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 the weather station. All these different dots that we have here are measurements that we did with our Baku in this vineyard. The Baku has an inbuilt GPS, which allows us to know exactly where this measurement was done. So all these dots that we are seeing here, okay, are uh, plants, leaves that were analyzed in this uh, farm, and exactly where they were measured. So this is very useful for us because we can in the ground to immediately identify where are the problems. So like we see here different dots, so the red dots are where are the problems. So by clicking on one of the dots, okay, so as an example here, it's giving me immediately what is the problem that this uh, uh, plant uh, is having. So in this case, it's ESCA, and in this case, there is no, nothing that we can do uh, to solve this, this problem in terms of this, this disease. Uh, but this is uh, the way that we do. If in case we were clicking in the other different dots, the red ones, it was giving us the, the the problem that was uh, facing there the blue dots are no problem so it means that it's uh, healthy um, uh, plants over there and all these it's possible because of machine learning that we measured uh, thousands and thousands of leaves every year so we we to give you a, 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 an example for every disease that we are chasing, we have to, to, to analyze the disease in different stages, from initial stage to a late stage, to be able to give all this prediction to our um, to our customers. So how we can uh, help the farmers in, in the field? First of all, with, with better selection of the product, okay? So with all this information that we are having, the, the, the farmer can select better the, 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 um, uh, the, what, the crop in this case. We can know where and when um, we need to intervene or where is the problem or where are my 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 data being collected we have also the possibility to do a better evaluation of my farm uh, in a very easy easy way to do some uh, detection of problems and to quickly um, solve it uh, before it's uh, the for instance the disease is growing or if there is some some water stress problem or if there is even some uh, nutrient uh, deficiency that we can act more 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 easily we we help also in terms of managing all these uh, data in a very uh, uh, good manner in the end we can have even better final results of our products okay it's an example here from 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 coming from the the, the grape to the wine and in the end we have the reporting so all these data can be nice to evaluate what happened, for instance, one year ago, to do some predictions for the year to come, uh, knowing that nowadays there is some variations uh, in the climate that uh, sometimes it's not um, stable comparing data, but anyhow, we can have better, better information to take decisions uh, with, with time. We have a lot of uh, partnerships, so we I show you some examples of uh, what is Xlora, uh, but we are having a lot of uh, collaborations and developing tools. So this is a, a small small example of a partnership that we did for for a project uh, in Greece, where we do, we supported to develop a system to do some optical uh, nurturing of leaf growth um dynamics for evaluation of the root uh, performance of new varieties of olive tree steam so in these cases like i said in the beginning we use multispectral as our technology so this is a multispectral um camera that was placed in the top uh to analyze the samples to collect uh, 24 by 24 uh data that later on was was evaluated 
for support these these uh, uh, these uh, these projects. So as a final remarks, um, our uh, solution we aim to 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 help every farmer to have better nutrition, better water management. Uh, prediction and detection of diseases when possible, of course, the, if the, this prediction and disease, diseases are in our algorithm. Uh, also to manage, when, to manage the, the treatments because we don't want to avoid treatments um, with chemicals and so on, but we want that the farmer can better uh, manage the, these. Uh, also to support less production costs with all this information that we are giving in advance that the, the farmer can have probably some more time to do perform other jobs in the farm and in the end to to help also to have a sustainable uh, agriculture practice so thank you very much to, thank you pedro to also all of for you. for a great presentation that was indeed very very interesting just one quick question uh pedro and taking from um uh, Paula's presentation how long have you been operating your um, machine learning algorithm that allows your Xlora technology um, to, to to come up with all the benefits that you've just yeah, pointed? We, yeah, we are uh, working on this uh, since uh, five years uh, already, so um, it's, it's already a long time. Uh, I have to say that the, our first, let's say, version of, of the, the algorithm for for classification, not for prediction, but for classification, was very poor in the beginning, okay, because it was missing all this data that the professor was, was talking. But along the years, and like I said uh, last year, that we did a very big campaign in the field. So um, feeding every year uh, the, the, the algorithm with more and more data. Uh, Cross, we are also uh, at the same time that we are uh, picking, let's say, leaves for analysis. We are also using these uh, these leaves to be analyzed by um, uh, external laboratories, also to cross check if we are on the right uh, path or not. So we are cr cross checking the what we are doing in our side with external uh, laboratory analysis, also. But uh, the let's say the the grow of our uh, precision and also in terms of the number of uh, diseases and other parameters it's mainly of the work that we are doing every year in growing uh, the the algorithm with more and more analysis okay so you also have independent validation from your results yes and i yes, am sure yes. that the farmers give you straight away to you know instant feedback if it's working or yes, not yes yeah, yes great. yes Pedro, yes. do you have a list of diseases that you can identify with Explora? Yes, yes, yes. At the moment, we have been very focused on, on vineyards. We are very, very, um, very focused on uh, on vineyards. So for for um, uh, identify for classification with uh, um, analysis with our leaf analyzer, okay, in the field. Uh, we have at the moment for uh, vineyards, we have uh, mildew, we have eschke, we have scoriosis and uh, erinosis, and we have also um, magnesium deficiency, okay, for classification with the analyzer. For prediction, we have mildew, powdery mildew, butritis, scoriosis, and we have also grey rot. Uh, I think it's all, if I'm not missing uh, any. So we have, let's say, two algorithms, one for the prediction with the sensors in the field, and with the leaf analyzer, we have another group of um, of, uh, of analysis. So with, yeah, with the, the leaf analyzer, we can also go uh, to, we have also giving information like NDVI, water stress, and so on. So, Okay, and maybe Francisca can complement what we can detect also in terms of diseases by performing microbial uh, analysis. Um, Pedro, um, you you mentioned that you are testing this to 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 olives, and you you touched upon how long does it take, or did it took um, your agronomists to be on the field to ensure that uh, this can be uh, perfected? 
Um, so olives, do you do? You, are we quite there for um, uh, yeah, with exports for, the olives, for yes, olives yes, and the, other cultures? Yeah, yeah. For for olives, it's uh, coming. Uh, not not this year, but for for next year. So with this project that we had in in Greece, so we have already uh, in the final stage to have a, a commercial solution. Okay, which will be very interesting. A little bit different from the one that we have from from for for the vineyards, and we are at the moment also discussing for for uh, other crops um uh, that that um, I cannot disclose this because in some cases we have also some some agreements with some some companies so but we are working with with other uh, crops uh, also so okay uh, for the time being next... you're more focused on vineyards okay and yes, should for the be time on the... Being, yes, yes yeah yes. on the lookout because you have more things on the pipeline okay and yes, you know the yes. 1 million dollar question pedro can you share yeah. some costs? <laughs> yes, up? this this uh, um, uh, I don't know who placed the the question, but for, for these in terms of these costs and so on, we normally are very cautious because this this is not an easy question to to. So we have uh, okay, the back who has a price, the 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 sensors have a price, the the cloud solution the algorithm has a price, but normally we try to tailor these uh, case by case because uh, we know that we have not the customers are not all the same so we have normally we are very cautious on this on this so if uh, one person or more are interested to to have some more uh, economical details uh, please let let me know through you or even with with the uh, the, the email that it was in the end of the, the presentation and Pedro, we will be probably more than glad to provide your, this. your email in the chat also so for those that didn't register at the presentation okay. i think that would be useful pedro you you mentioned that you have sensors in the field and i was just wondering uh, what is the the level of maintenance of those sensors in the fields? We heard that there's lots of damage by animals and there's lots of of challenges. Is, is this a problem for the system or not? Uh, it can be. It can be because we have the the, the instrumentation in the field, so it can be uh, damaged, like you said, by animals, by the machines, by a tractor. Okay, that are going on the field. So these these are are issues, of course, that we need to 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 be careful. It's nothing to do with maintenance because it's out of our control. So when we are going, when we install these in the farms, first of all, we talk with the, with the, with the farmers, and we try to sort it out the best place to put it to avoid any possible damage by uh, machinery first of all and of course if there is an animal going there we cannot cannot control there but i have to say that the level of um, maintenance it's uh, um, at least uh, uh, a visit maintenance visits per year okay being also the, the fact that most of these can be also controlled in our uh, by the farmer in our um, uh, solution so the farmer has an actual status and if there is a problem it's immediately reported okay so um and we can actuate together with the farmer on this but okay I have so you have the, real time monitoring of yes, the state there is of a, uh, yeah if there is a problem so imagine that we have the soil sensors in the soil if there is any problem it's immediately reported in our in our platform mm -hmm. and then uh, of course normally the farm is there so we try to support online the farmer but if it's needed we go there to solve to solve the problem but at least once per year okay to have a global uh, checkup uh, to see if all the parameters in terms of calibration and so on it's i would say that at least uh, once once per year Okay, great. Pedro, thank you so much for these insights and explanations. I'm okay. sure you will continue the conversations with some of our participants. I now have uh, Francisca. Hello, Francisca. And let me just introduce you to Francisca while well, Francisca shares the presentation. So Francisca has a professional career as focal focus on agroforestry systems, particularly vines, chestnut trees and uh, cork oak. And she has specialized in soil microbiology, 
positive interactions, so beneficial microorganisms, and negative interactions, so the pathogenic microorganisms. And she has carried out research into minimizing the effects of climate change on the physiological adaptation of plants and emerging diseases using bioagents and biofertilizers. Francisca, it's a pleasure to have you here. We are now ready for your presentation. Just give us a thumbs up and the floor is yours. Thank you, Claudia, for your kindly presentation. So the, the work that I will present here today is regarding the functional microbiome and how this tool can be uh, priceless for farmers. So as Pedro uh, speak in uh, talk in the last presentation, we are facing several farming challenges. Um, one of them is the increased population, the limited resources for uh, feeding all this uh, population, uh, also the soil erosion and degradation due to intensive agriculture practices, and um, also the increasing of pests and diseases. This pests and diseases has also uh, increased uh, because we are decreasing the genetic diversity of the crops and also because we are uh, an over um, worldwide distribution of agriculture. But the question is, how can we face these uh, challenges? And the question is efficiency. We need to increase the efficiency of treatments, of um, use of resource and use of land uh, available for agriculture. And for that, how can we achieve this uh, efficiency? Using precise precision agriculture. The cycle of precision agriculture begins with the data collection and then we perform the data analysis uh, from the, the inputs planning and the resource application, as we see in previous uh, speakers, for instance, using the drone satellites and so on. Then we perform the crop mapping and the evaluation. And then we restart this cycle in order to optimize this, uh, both the inputs planning, the resource application, the crop mapping and so on. So, the, this uh, precise uh, uh, farming, uh, this precision farming, can be very useful for the farmers in their phones, in the tablets, or even the computers. But it's important also to, to use these tools, for instance, like I told you before, the drones, for, for instance, for health assessment, irrigation, crop monitoring, crop spraying, planting, and some field analysis, but also for water management uh, with, for instance, automatic irrigation and livestock management uh, for, uh, for uh, measure productivity and health. And for last and not the least, soil management using, for instance, analysis of soil status, temperature, and humidity. Traditionally, the soil analysis is most based on physical chemical analysis. For instance, moisture, soil pH, the most micronutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, and also soil temperature. But my question is, what is missing? And what is missing is exactly the question that was performed in Slido in the beginning the soil microbiome. As you see previously, there is a huge community that is lack in these traditional soil measurements. The soil microbiome is a very interesting tool because it works in two different ways. The first way, it's begin with the plant. The plant can give the soil some root exudates that differentiate the soil microbiome. The traditional example is, for instance, the legumes, which can fix uh, in the, the soil the uh, nitrogen fixation bacteria. On the other hand, the soil microbiome can, mo can modulate the crop and the yield, and for that we call it microbiome services. 
But this kind of graphics and some fancy names are very difficult to interpret by farmers. So the question is, can farmers use this information on their daily challenges? And I guess you already know the answer. And the answer is no, because these graphics were designed for academic purposes. These graphics with very uh, with a lot of colors, a lot of Latin names, and for instance, these heat maps are very difficult to interpret. It. So we create this functional microbiome information, which is directly uh, supply the information that farmer needs to do the um, the field uh, interventions in the in the, the agriculture uh, crops. So. Our, our main parameters that we analyze are soil quality, soil health, and soil nutrition. Soil quality is based on parameters such as the microbial biodiversity of the soil, the functionality, and also the resistance. On the other hand, the soil health is based on parameters such as biocontrol, hormone production, and stress adaptation. And the last, the nutrition, we are based in micro and micronutrients, and here I have presented the most common ones, which are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And taking into consideration the importance of this functional microbiome information, Food for Sustainability has recently uh, uh, opened his um, its soil microbiology lab, which is located nearby Lisbon in a, a small town called Ruda dos Vinhos, and it is specialized in this functional microbiome. We analyze the soil DNA of this uh, microbiota uh, present in soil, and then we perform these functional reports and also advise our end recommendation for farmers. But why should the farmer do this investment investment on these reports? First of all, because the inform this is a very powerful information for decision support. On the other hand, we have the optimization and um, the optimization or fertilization and pesticide application. On another hand, we had this uh, water efficiency optimization by studying, for instance, the the, um, the ratio between fungal and bacterial communities. Then we have of these two parameters. We have uh, optimization of production costs by maximizing the crop yield, and indeed we can also increase the SOC um, in, the, in the soil. So, and overall, if we have a high biodiversity, high high activity of uh, microbes in soil, we have a decrease of production costs. Our reports has a, a description of communities in soil that can be uh, involved in nutrition cycles, growth promoting promotion based mainly on uh, hormone production, stress adaptation, biocontrol and bio bioremediation and others. Uh, for instance, the, the yeasts that are important for vinification processes. Beyond that, we have a very powerful uh, tool that we use in our reports, which is our soil database. This database is constructed every day, so it's an ongoing process, and we uh, take together all the information, all the scientific information published worldwide in scientific papers. Nowadays, we have almost 25,000 entries of over 800 plant species or crops, with two, more than 2,000 microbial species, about 900 scientific papers. So you to have uh, an idea how it works, I have here, um, for instance, we are trying to uh, discover a biocontrol agent that can control a disease in apple tree. And we check in our, our database, and you see here that when we search for uh, Malus domestica, which is apple washer, ap apple tree, and our uh, disease that is called by Apologies, yes. the slides are not moving. We're still we're, we're not seeing the queries from the database. If you, that's what you're supposed, we are supposed to see. You are not seeing the 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 Excel sheet. No. No. You just see the entries, the number of plant species, microbial species, and the number of scientific papers that support the database. And now do you see the? No. 
No, I will try to reshare. OK. So Francisco is just um, uh, elucidating about a powerful tool that uh, we use to, to assist and inform our soil microbiome analysis and is trying to give us an example how useful this can be also to search for solutions or to identify problems. Can you see already? Uh, not from my end. Francisca, uh, for me, I have a, an empty screen. Yeah. Yeah, OK, I, no. yeah. OK. You can go forward, forward. Yeah, perfect. perfect. This is by your okay. control. Thank you. So as I was saying that, uh, for instance, in this case, we are looking for a biocontrol agent that can be used in a disease called by this uh, Erwinia pathogen in apple tree. And we search in our database, and you can see here that, uh, in the column called microbe that you have several different um, microbes that uh, were uh, described in literature that can be um, can be used as biocontrol against Erwinia in in apple uh, tree. So, but so you un better understand the potential of this um, this functional microbiome i bring to you three case studies the first one was regarding the olive grove grazing uh, a farmer came to us uh, to um, to study the soil microbiome and soil health because he wants to uh, introduce in his olive um, olive grove a grazing system using sheep so we performed a field trial, uh, a small plot using an extensive grazing system when we have small number of sheep per hectare and uh, another, another plot using intensive grazing system where it has a, num a high number of sheep per hectare. And the results were very interesting because unlike, unlike what has is described in literature, in this case, we have higher health uh, uh, soil health uh, in intensive plots comparing to extensive plots. Even in nutrition, we have higher rates of phosphor cycle um, uh, activity when compared to extensive uh, uh, grazing system. The second case study, uh, case study was the apple washer disease. A farmer has a problem in a, a, a apple orchard and we sample two different soil samples, one in the problem, um, problem orchard, another one in the healthy, and we compare both samples. And uh, by the, the preliminary results, we saw immediately that the problem was the resistance. A more discriminating study, when we study 41 um, pathogen species that are able to cause diseases in apple orchards, we saw that four pathogens were common to both orchards, but two were specific from the orchard with a problem. And one of these pathogens was Phytophthora, which is a very aggressive pathogen for many crop species and for apple trees in particular. In this case, we give some specific advice and recommendation to the farmer in order to control the pathogen and to uh, improve the soil health in these orchards. And the third case study is uh, the vineyard production system. We have a farmer that has two different um, two different vineyards. One of these vineyards is um, is producing in regenerative viticulture when the, they use uh, interrow with a cover cropping and small amounts of chemical applications. On the other hand, you have the conventional viticulture, as you see in the picture, they usually use herbicides in order to maintain the inter-row with a low, um, low cover crop. The results of soil microbiology was very clear. The first of all, the soil quality is significantly higher in regenerative viticulture when compared to conventional viticulture. 
On the other hand, when you are speaking about the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium cycles, we saw that in conventional viticulture, these nutrient cycles were very depleted. In this case, we advise the, the, that the, the conventional viticulture should increase the biodiverse cover crop in the intervals. On the other hand, this farmer should supply with organic matter at least once a year. And then we sh they should avoid unnecessary tilling and also monitoring the soil quality in order to see if these changes with, uh, are increasing the soil quality. So, the, as you probably understand, the soil is a very complex system. In order to have better agriculture, better soil, better yield, you have to have better information. Because in our opinion, better information is it will be clear, better decisions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francisca, for such an interesting presentation. Um, unfortunately, the time flies here at Thursdays afternoon. Um, just a quick question, Francisca. How difficult it is to implement this analysis for a farmer? What does it take? This analysis is very simple to implement because the sample collection is very similar to a physical chemical analysis. So we need to 100 to 200 grams of soil and the farmer just need to put in the plastic bag and send to our lab and then we perform the the lab work and send the report and the recommendations to the, the to the farmer okay so it's not difficult probably uh, we also should do a visit beforehand to 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 the farm uh, and to visit the, the the context of of the farm to 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 be able to provide those recommendations yeah, we not... ask we ask a lot of questions regarding, for instance, the the practice if they work in organic or conventional or regenerative, uh, which kind of uh, um, crop they they have in the field. So we ask a lot of questions to the farmer. Okay, good, Francisca. What do you say to a farmer that is quite skeptical about the soil microbiology? You cannot see it difficult to measure, well, at least we are providing a measurement instrument now, but what would you say would be the main advantage to start paying more attention to soil microbiome? It's a very interesting question. Uh, for me, the main advantage is that we have this, uh, we can have this information to potentiate the natural resource that already exists in soil. So if you have more if, if you can have more um for instance nitrogen availability in soil without add artificial nitrogen why not you just have to know what happened in your soil and you can optimize your production and uh, your production costs yields and even the farmer profits so it's all good so you're decreasing costs you're getting your baseline better so uh please jump on board if you want to know a little bit more about uh, everything that is happening in terms of soil microbiology. Unfortunately, we don't have much time, so I would just like uh, to address now a final question uh, to all of our our speakers. So I would just ask you, how do you see um, in all these approaches? We have very different approaches, but you know, all, all of them trying to focus on more efficiency, you know, more care about the environment, more care about the farmer's baseline. How do you see all this uh, coming together, transforming the future of farming? And what would be the major takeaway that you would like farmers to, to leave this webinar with? So it's a very round question. So what is your key message from today's session? Pedro, would you like to start? Yes, I can. I can add some 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 words. Uh, first, first of all, from uh, the three presentations, we we saw uh, three uh, different approaches that are, in my point of view, complementary. So um, I think one one important thing is that there is a lot of um, new uh, and interesting. Uh, uh, solutions uh, in the market to give uh, better better uh, decision 
power to to the farmers and i think the takeaway message is what we are feeling is that and um, that they should be more open for us because there is really good solutions uh, in the market that can help them in very uh, different ways like uh, uh, fast fast information reduction of uh, uh, costs for instance so and uh, some some of the, the solutions are really user friendly and very easy so but so if they take away this part of reluctance in terms of of new things and be more open this is something that will take uh, time uh, we know but uh, it's my my opinion that uh, i think that there's a lot of complementary solutions all of them together are are valid or even individually and uh, the the farmers uh, the market in this case should be also more open uh, to hear and to try and to see uh, the benefits demonstration 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 yes, we need to yes. have more uh, you know there's the lighthouse farms there there are the tools that even the, the european union is pushing forwards more test beds more 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 sites demonstrations that we can really show what we are doing it's actually uh, worthwhile uh, adopting paula one final remark i would say that research is very important for uh, to have these solutions on market, we have to have people that are uh, researching, that are experiment, that try to do things that can be good or bad. We don't know. That is the question because when we are uh, investigate an issue, maybe the solution that we are uh, trying to proceed is not actually the best one but this is something that has to be done and this is the part that research is very important to not take do not fear to not have success sometimes it happens but to research to try to explore new ideas and new concepts that when they are very well uh, integrated and uh, very well refined, we can explore in the market. And that is something that is very important to have research. <laughs> yes, and that's a good point because the, you mentioned uh, failures and failures makes is part of the progress. But for sure, that cannot be on the hands of farmers because they cannot afford, you know, all the fav failure. No, so someone no, needs to bear. They, they can risk. understand the importance of the research. Sometimes yes, they don't understand. Definitely. So we have to have in our universities and research centers research that, again, we, we are going to address some issues that when the passing of by, we can pass to the people on the market and they can uh, address these issues in a more clear and easy way. And this is the part that I think that is important for farmers to understand why it's important to have research in our country. Yes, and even probably the concept of co-creation, bringing all the parts uh, together and ensure that the solutions are really that fitting. That is a very needs. key point. We... Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> Francisco, one final remark. My final remark is just to farmers do not need to be afraid of obtaining more information. If they have any doubts regarding these new technologies, they just can ask and we explain. They do not have to buy immediately. They can ask information and then if they want, to, they didn't want to apply to all the field, they can use a field trial, small scale, uh, step by step trying and demonstrate in their own field so yes, that's, that's my my take home message okay that's great so i, I will leave just one final uh, remark so if you want to know more of any of these uh, technologies uh, you can contact us we'll put you in contact with uh, pedro and francisca and, and paula so please feel free if you you know, something comes up to your mind later on. We are here uh, to assist you. Sorry that we didn't have time to answer all the questions, but uh, I would like to thank 
all the participants, all the audience for your uh, participation and your engagement. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, we will continue with the Precision Agriculture. So please uh, keep coming. It's very nice to have you. We will address more robotics and drones in our next session. So please stay tuned. Food for Sustainability and Grow webinars all together to deliver the best of knowledge, state of the art research. And thank you so much for joining. Bye bye. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.